Welcome everyone to the Cardano Effect Podcast, episode 31. The purpose of this podcast is to take high-level developer information and projects that are occurring within the Cardano space and break them down into bite-sized, consumable pieces of information for everyday use. I'm your host, Philippe, and let's get this podcast started. So welcome to episode 31. We have Rick and myself as the host today, and we do have a special guest who Rick will be introducing very shortly. I wanted to remind everyone, if you missed episode 30 of the Cardano Effect podcast, we had David Esser, the uh, the senior product manager of IOHK. We were talking about everything from test nets to Gogan to roadmap updates and what IOHK plans to do for the future. So please go check that episode out. If you're watching this episode now and have not subscribed to the Cardano Effect, please consider subscribing. We appreciate all the new viewers and listeners. We're streaming on multiple platforms as well, so that's wonderful. And leave us your comments below. We're going to get right into the mix of things. None of what we say on this podcast is financial advice or should be taken as such. Remember, you are your best financial advisor, and if you do not think you are, you need to find someone who's qualified to do so. With that being said, Rick, how are you doing today? What's going on? Philippe, I'm doing great. I'm out in sunny San Diego, one of my favorite home away from home places to be. And uh, we've got a special guest coming on today. Before we go on to Robert, um, I would like to give a shout out to our sponsor, IOHK. I would like to thank you guys for sponsoring this podcast. It really helps offset the cost of our service providers, and it makes it a little bit more worthwhile to get the uh, podcast up and running. So thank you, IOHK, for that. And I'd also like to announce that the podcast is now available on iHeartRadio, and it took several months to do that. I might have mentioned it during the last podcast, but this is the first full podcast where we are on iHeartRadio, and uh, that was a really nice achievement to have. So it's available also on Google Play Music, iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud. Our feed provider is Libsyn. So uh, thanks, iHeart, for putting us on your program, and it was a little bit of work getting there, but it was definitely worth it. So next, we want to go on to our special guest, Mr. Robert Karnacki, and Robert is a D-Lab Emergo Fellow, and also uh, he's a kind of a co-creator along with Marcus Guffler of the uh, the Rock Pie that's going to be coming up online. The reason we have him on our program today is he is the founder of Sire, and he started that project around uh, January 2019. When I first met Robert, Philippe and I met Robert out at Plutus Fest out there in uh, the University of Edinburgh. And uh, at the time, he was just Robert, the other dude that we know from the, the uh, from Plutus Fest. But now he's the Emergo D Lab fellow, and it's really great to see so much work coming along. Robert, I really appreciate your work. Uh, so tell us uh, how are you doing today, Robert? Where are you dialing in from? Thank you, Rick. Uh, I'm doing quite well today. It's the uh, end of a long week, uh, lots of hecticness. I actually just came back from uh, New York last week where I was uh, at the D-Lab offices, and I am dialing in from uh, Toronto, Canada right now. All right, cool. So tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe some little bit about your background. Right. So, I mean, this could go many different directions, but essentially I've been a programmer for most of my life. And I am a crypto enthusiast since around 2013. And my whole jump into Cardano and cryptocurrencies in general was due to the fact that I think that there's a lot of great moves forward we can make through the use of technology. And the I think it's rather obvious, especially after the financial crisis, uh, you know, a decade back, that there's a lot of improvements we can make where if we use code to make sure that bad actors can't do what we don't want them to do, then maybe we can actually make a better society in the long term. And that's kind of what drew me into cryptocurrencies. And then what really brought me into Cardano was especially the fact that, hey, we can use these things called formal methods. And I, as a functional programmer for about for almost four years now, and a uh, you know, dabbling with some experience in formal verification and formal specification lately in the past two years. Once I saw that Cardano was one of the first cryptocurrencies actually pursuing that, then I was like, well, hey, that sounds like something I want to get behind, something I want to invest time into. And that's one of the reasons why I went out to Edinburgh for Plutus Fest and I met you guys is because I was quite excited that, hey, there's this first functional programming language for smart contracts coming out. And this might actually completely change what's possible. And so we won't have another 
DAO hack, but we can actually have smart contracts that work and actually help to create a better future. And that's why I'm part of the Cardano ecosystem. That's why I've invested so much time into Clio One, uh, into the Rock Pies, and now as a DLab fellow working on Sire. That's fantastic. So you bring some experience with you from the functional programming world uh, into the Cardano system. And I'm glad you enumerated all the different things you're working on. That's right. The Clio.1, you're working on that, the Rock Pi, and now the, the Sire. And the Sire, the Sire.io is the website for that. We'll make sure we put a link to Sire.io down in the comment section so that people can get to that. So let's start with the big picture here. What is Sire? Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So... Something that everyone who uses cryptocurrencies has faced is that almost existential dread you have, which whenever you send a transaction, you're not quite sure that it'll actually arrive at the wallet you expect it will. You know, you usually just on PC, you just copy an address, paste it in your wallet, double, triple, quadruple check, press send, and then you're left praying, right? That's a really error prone process. And maybe you hit a key on your keyboard along the way. Maybe you failed copying. Maybe you have a clipboard editing malware. Maybe even the person who gave you the address messed up copying it themselves. You know, there's many ways this whole process can go wrong. And it's all reliant on the person. And they take 100% of the risk with 100% of the funds. You know, in any other context in life, if you put that much risk on people and when there's money on the line, you'd say this is a horribly designed system, right? It just doesn't really make sense to put erring humans in the place of holding all this money, especially when people might be sending transactions worth thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. This is kind of a crazy system we have that's the default in cryptocurrencies. And so um, in the start of uh, 2019, I uh, submitted to become a D-Lab fellow and uh, Emergo, SOSV, the two uh, sponsors of the D-Lab Startup Accelerator, they uh, came to me and asked me like, hey, can you try and solve this problem? And so since a little bit uh, before the start of the year, I really got into thinking, how can we solve this transaction surety problem of making sure that I am guaranteed that I know when I press confirm, it actually sends the money to your address as I expect. And so Sire came out of this. And so currently we have these push-based systems in which I've kind of identified the problems with. Sire instead is a blockchain agnostic, tokenless, invoice-based protocol, which solves this. And the reason for making it blockchain agnostic and tokenless is that you shouldn't require even complex smart contracts or smart contracts at all, or this system that's locked into just one blockchain. When you could instead use good system design that no matter whether you're transacting on Cardano or maybe one day even a side chain of Cardano or even let's say Bitcoin or Ethereum and these older cryptocurrencies, you can have one solid standard that solves all these problems. And that's what really Sire is. It's an invoice based solution that gives you guarantees through cryptography that when you actually press confirm on an invoice, it actually goes to the person you expect it to go to. I wanted to break down the first thing that you said because people often look at those convoluted addresses, whether you're in Bitcoin or you're Cardano or Ethereum, whatever cryptocurrency you're using, it's usually a long string string of numbers and letters, and it's very easy to make a mistake. And this 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 problem just doesn't affect blockchain; it affects affects the legacy system as well. If you're a personal user and you're sending money via PayPal. You have to make sure that the email address you're sending it to is correct or some random person's going to get your money. If you're a business and you're wiring money, you have to make sure that that bank account is a verified bank account. And I know as a business owner, when I add a new account to my, to my, to my bank, it gives me a little green check to make sure that that bank actually exists and the, 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 all the wiring information is correct and it matches that account. So I'm assuming that that's the same kind of logic that you're implying with Sire. You're going to be that kind of green check or verifier for blockchain, if I'm not correct. So in essence, um, what Sire does slightly differently than a green check is often those green checks require a centralized authority, right? And they're the one who 
provides the green check uh, for you so that, yes, you know it's going to the right place. Instead of having a centralized authority, the idea of Sire is to use cryptography, which all blockchains already use, so that, for example, when I request an invoice from you, that the request itself has essentially, this might be getting a little bit too detailed for now, but uh, just really quickly, essentially you uh, use a signature and to create a signature with cryptography, what that means is you have to have your private key. When you have your private key and you create a signature, that means you own the address. And so when I send an invoice to you or you send an invoice to me with a signature, what that means is that if I fulfill the invoice, well, then I send it back to the exact same place where the signature came from. So it's literally impossible for me to send to the wrong address because you appended the signature with your invoice. And so it's not you know, looking to a centralized authority, but it's using mathematics itself to guarantee that it actually goes to the right place. Very interesting. Very interesting. So what are the where can it go wrong? Is Are there any places where it can go wrong? I know that once you sign your keys, it's going to verify that it's going to go from party A to party B. But are there any steps in the process that you have not necessarily figured out how to 100% guarantee? Right. So, you know, well, you, whenever you're doing any system design, it's impossible to defend from actors who are all knowing, who can do everything. And so there's at some point always going to be some step of the way where there's probably a hacker, a fisher can actually scam someone. But the thing is with Sire, uh, there are, so for example, replay attacks on blockchain. So if you're posting an invoice or sending an invoice on blockchain, if you just put the data publicly, then what that means is everyone can see your invoice. One possible attack if you do that is, oh, I'm a bad actor. I saw Philippe sent a invoice to someone. I can copy all the data he put on the invoice, send it myself. And if the person who's receiving the invoice, if they didn't know which one of us is actually Philippe, well then, oops, you know, they can fulfill the wrong one and a bad actor steals the money. But I mean, obviously I'd hope I'd uh, think of a solution for that. And, you know, it's not just uh, that easily breakable. And so for Sire, for in that case, and what actually makes Sire uh, quite resistant to attacks is the fact that uh, for the invoices, all of them are encrypted with the receiver's public key. And so no one except the receiver of the invoice can see what's inside of the invoice. And this provides a lot of strong guarantees that bad actors can't do anything because they're blind. They can't see anything in the invoice. If it's on-chain, then, okay, maybe they can figure out, hey, there's an encrypted blob being sent with a transaction. Maybe that's a Sire invoice. Off-chain, no one will know if you send it via email, if you send it via carrier pigeon, if you send it via, you know, any, an API via web browser. Usually it's, unless the hacker already controls, uh, let's say a merchant server, there's no way they can actually see the invoice. And so given that you have this dynamic where, Publicly, when you're uh, posting Sire invoices on the blockchain, everything is encrypted and impossible to see. And off-chain, there's almost no case where a man-in-the-middle attack could happen because you're doing directly peer-to-peer -peer through email or whatever else. And it's still encrypted also. Uh, the attack vector is really, really, really tiny. And if people are interested, they can go to Sire.io and there's the white paper. And you can see more of the design decisions made and uh, the security uh, that's provided and the prevention of possible attacks. I have a good question. Thank you for that explanation. It was a little bit over my head. I understood some of it because I watched your video before. So I have, <laughs> you, it is a very good video. We need to link that down below as well, where you package the encrypted stuff up. That was really cool. Like the invoices inside the encrypted package. But uh, I want to go back to earlier, you described that Sire is blockchain agnostic. Now let's assume for a moment, uh, I don't know what I'm doing, which is pretty easy to assume. Okay. <laughs> and, and you use the term blockchain agnostic. What does that mean? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So all blockchain agnostic means is that Sire is designed so that it'll work on Cardano, it'll work on Ethereum, it'll work on Bitcoin, 
and it should technically work on every single blockchain out there. It's designed to be as simple as possible and it doesn't require its own token, it doesn't require another blockchain of its own so that everyone can use it. And the idea is that eventually uh, with multi-currency wallets, they only need to implement the Sire UI once. And then for, let's say you have 20 different cryptocurrencies, if they all implement Sire as well, well, then you have this great standard of invoices and this great standard for providing transaction surety so that no matter which cryptocurrency you use, you can use that one wallet and use Sire invoices for all the cryptocurrencies. And so it's essentially making cryptocurrencies transactions for all cryptocurrencies better, not just Cardano. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's great news. And speaking of wallets, uh, which wallets are you looking at implementing in? Which ones are we going for first? Right. So uh, as I am a part of DLab, one thing uh, that I am currently working on is implementing Sire straight into Tesseract's wallets, which I believe you had Tesseract, uh, the CEO and uh, their CMO a few months ago, if I recall correctly. Yes, we had Daniel Lepping and Gilad Waxman on on the episode for Tesseract. And those guys can deliver. I am really proud of those guys. I got to go off on a tangent for a moment. Daniel <laughs> said, when we were doing the episode in March, we're filming it. And I, and I said during that episode, I said, Daniel, when do you plan on having a product available? Because people are always like, you know, when Shelly, when Roadmap, okay, when Tesseract. He had a slight grin on his face and he said, May. And I was like, May? What? <laughs> He delivered. He delivered two products, the Tesseract wallet for Ethereum and an SDK for iOS. And I'm like, wow, these these guys can put out some code. It was cool. So Tesseract wallet, that's fantastic news. I'm glad to hear that. Tell us more about this. Indeed. So like you said, they're really hardworking. They really try to get stuff out really quickly. And so far, I've enjoyed working with them. And so essentially, uh, within their wallets, and also they have the open wallet standard, can go uh, Google or go to Tesseract.one, I believe is their website now, uh, to kind of have more information about what they're doing. But essentially, uh, they're having a mobile and eventually web browser based wallet that seeks to enhance the user experience dramatically. And Sire is a really great fit for that because I'm trying to help people never lose their money ever again. And so this is a great uh, collaboration between them as a D-Lab startup and me as a D-Lab fellow and so uh, I'm implementing first in their wallet, especially since uh, we have Shelly coming out in Cardano soon. And uh, a lot of code that's written, and especially for Sire, if we were to implement into, say, Uroi, which we are going to be, and I'll get to that in a moment, uh, right away, a lot of the code would be deprecated once Shelly is released. And it just wouldn't really make sense to put in all that time and effort. So instead, right now I'm working with Tesseract, which is also going to be a multi-currency wallet. And we're implementing Sire uh, by most likely mid-summer uh, and have it fully running and ready and open for people to use on iOS and just have a really great user interface for sending cryptocurrencies. And this is going to be first on Ethereum, which is their wallet supports right now. And eventually that's going to be on Tesseract side, expanding to Cardano and very likely many more blockchains which they're going to support. And so the idea is since Ethereum is in a slightly more stable state, it's easier to implement the first uh, implementation of Sire in Ethereum, get it all tested, figure out the exact UI that makes it really work great. And then after that, once there's an implementation, we can have an understanding of Sire much more so than now then once Shelly comes out, we can implement straight into Uroi, which I'm already currently working with Emergo. I mean, I'm a Emergo d fellow, so I'm constantly talking with Sebastian, Ruslan, Nico, and everyone from Emergo. And so uh, Sire is already slated to be implemented into Uroi. And so once Shelly uh, gets finished, that will be the next big hurdle for Sire and getting it in the hands of Cardano users. And also, on the side, I am currently talking with a couple other wallets and possibly integrations into some software. And so there's a bright future ahead of Sire and having people uh, able to test it out and try it for themselves and use it in wallets like Uroi, which they use every single day themselves, and actually have transaction surety and 
the knowledge that, hey, I'm not going to lose my money. And so it's really exciting for me to have this on multiple wallets coming out within the year. And I look forward to seeing what people think, how it, uh, how the experience is like, and then maybe one day taking the entire cryptocurrency space, but that might just be a pipe dream. <laughs> yeah. You know, hey, Robert, I'm going to ask you 80% of your questions right now. And those questions are, when Ledger? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, man. Okay, Philippe, go ahead, man. What do you got, buddy? <laughs> So I want to backtrack to what you were talking about at the beginning uh, when you first introduced Sire. And I want to break it. I want you to break it down for the, the viewers. Uh, this whole idea of on-chain versus off-chain. What exactly does this mean? And why is Sire interacting with on-chain transactions differently than off-chain transactions? Could you explain that to us? Right. So all the transactions themselves are on chain, but the distinction between on chain and off chain is specifically how the Sire invoice is delivered. So let's say I have Philippe's address and I just want to send him a Sire invoice. I can send him a Sire invoice on chain and that's really easy. It's, you know, it's peer to peer. There's no middleman. I don't have to use some other software or other protocol or messaging system. It's just really easy and clean. However, what that does instill is a transaction fee and you have to wait for it to get propagated through the network. And so there's maybe, you know, a 30 second minute delay between me sending the invoice and you receiving it. In a peer to peer basis, that's quite optimal. Usually you're paying half a cent, one cent transaction fee. It's really not a big deal, right? But in a lot of use cases, maybe that's not the best thing. Maybe if you have an e-commerce website, for example, and you're a merchant who has a checkout page, a one minute uh, time frame for the user to receive an invoice, that's not really good user experience, right? And the fact that the uh, merchant has to pay a transaction fee, that's not really that good. So off-chain invoices, they require uh, an additional signature, which you can check out the white paper to understand why that is. But uh, pretty much the off-chain invoices allow for, say, a online checkout page, let's say WooCommerce, to directly implement Sire so that when the user presses checkout with Sire invoice, it instantly pops up the Euroi web wallet and then has the full invoice uh, streamed via API calls from the web page to the wallet. And so the user experience is seamless, instant, and the guarantees are not after waiting for one minute, but essentially immediately and provide a better user experience than anything we have today. And so the off-chain invoices allow uh, much different user experiences than on-chain invoices, but on-chain invoices are typically uh, much easier for the average person if you already have someone's address. So these transactions are going to differ. We we're talking about Sire being blockchain agnostic. They're going to differ depending on what blockchain you're using. I mean, if you're using Bitcoin it's and the network is clogged, on-chain transactions are going to take a lot longer than if you're using Cardano or a much faster blockchain. And Ethereum gets clogged sometimes as well. Um, yeah. There are faster than Cardano and there are slower than Cardano. But um, uh, I think that's very important for you to be communicating off chain and make sure that those happen very quickly. A lot of people are on the assumption that even when you're swiping your credit card, that the processes are instant, but they're actually a lot longer than what people think. There's a lot of um, trust issues. Uh, there's a lot of trust that goes between a bank and a credit card processing company. And they basically, one party assumes a certain level of risk. So if you can if you can accomplish this feat in blockchain, you're actually more secure and you're actually doing things without this whole idea of having some kind of third party as a trusted actor that says, okay, this transaction can go through. So I think that's wonderful. Um, I don't know if, I am, if I'm explaining it correctly, but that's no, my understanding you, of it. Yeah, no, I think you explained that pretty well because what I'm getting from this is that it's a it's a hybrid. So you have a hybrid between you have a blockchain system and then you have this um, off-chain thing and you're still using blockchain to conduct a transaction. Yeah. 
But if you were to send an invoice on chain, it's going to take more bytes. And if you take more bytes, you're going to have a higher transaction fee. But yeah. if it's off chain, you'll have a lower transaction fee. And you also see that instantaneous human response, which is very important. People like that they click a button and they get a response. They don't like the idea, like Robert described, if you click a button and you have to wait 30 seconds, what do people normally do if you have to wait? Well, they'll click the button again. I, I see it all the time. They go, oh, I want to click it again until I actually see a response. So by using the, the web service as opposed to on-chain, they'll see faster responses uh, with the application, right? Exactly. And also, uh, one thing that's also possible with the off-chain invoices is that since you're not paying a transaction fee like on-chain, you can actually add extra data. And so this kind of brings into the idea of Sire extensions, which in essence, it's the idea that, hey, you have a standard for invoices, but invoices are quite useful in that they can add a lot of extra data. And so here's some uh, uh, example use case that really uh, shows one of the benefits of these. So currently, when you make purchases online with cryptocurrencies, when you go to check out on a web page, usually you press checkout, a window pops up, it says you have 15 minutes to send X amount of uh, Ethereum, ADA, whatever, to a uh, Y address. So then you copy and paste that address, and it's a very error prone process as we talked about before. But what's really uh, key to note is that there is a 15 minute ticking timer on the web page, and you as the human have to keep looking at that ticking timer and making sure that, hey, when I send, you know, confirm my transaction and send it, it's before the 15 minutes go out. So what this system does is puts even more responsibility on the human being, even more so than peer to peer transactions. And so what's possible with Sire extensions is instead when you press checkout with uh, Sire invoice, it can take that 15 minute timer as an invoice expiration date or time and send it with the invoice so that when it automatically opens up in your Uroi web wallet, well then the timer will be in the wallet itself. And so if the timer runs out, then the wallet will stop you from actually confirming the transaction and the transaction won't be made. So instead of relying on you, the person, to make sure that it's within the 15 minutes, you can actually use the software to do that and actually give you more transaction surety, not just in a simple you know, peer-to-peer -peer sense, but actually improving the entire user experience even in a merchant merchant checkout process. You know, I've actually made two mistakes, both mistakes you described there. I've made the copy and paste mistake. Fortunately, I was sending it to my own wallet. I had control, so I had to send it back to where I meant to send it. So I've made that one with copy and paste. And I've also made the mistake of sending twice because I sent once and I looked at it and I go, oh, it didn't go. Did I not click the send button? Did I not enter the four digit code, correct, the six digit code correctly, the two factor authentication? Did I do something wrong? So I did it again. And then like 10 minutes later, I realized, oh, I sent that twice. Fortunately, I had control of both ends. If I was sending that to a merchant, I may, I would have lost the funds that have been gone. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree. And um, I have to bring up another story. I'm sure a lot of people can sympathize with this. If you're keeping your cryptocurrency in cold storage or on paper wallets and you you want to move something to a paper wallet or cold storage or vice versa back to an exchange, usually for me, it's like, OK, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and this day is going to be dedicated with me taking my time and sending it from address A to address B. Even though I've done a lot of transactions in my life, but you know, once you lose it, you lose it forever. So that is really good. Um, I wanted to move to, you were mentioning the merchant processing um, aspect of this. So in traditional, in the traditional legacy system, when you go to a store, the credit card charges the merchant a fee. Usually the, the merchant usurps all that fee. And it's usually up to 3%. If you're a volume retailer, if you're like a Walmart, you can 
push that down to like 1.9, 2%. But it depends on the number of transactions you have. But that's what they pay to credit card fees and they all divvy it up. So for this invoice processing system for crypto, um, I'm not sure of Sire's business model, but say you were approached by a site like, let's say, Newegg. I don't know if they accept Bitcoin or not. I believe yeah. they do. Okay, so um, they're processing a lot of transactions every day. If you were to implement your software within Newegg, would you be charging a micro fee? I mean, would you? You don't have to charge three percent, but is there an incentive for maybe companies in the future that do similar invoice? processing platforms in crypto to charge some semblance of a of a transaction fee or a processing fee for this invoice processing platform, if that makes any sense. Right. So one of the great things about Sire and why I'm thankful to uh, D-Lab for funding me for my fellowship to research into this is that Sire in itself is just an open source protocol. There is no fees. There's no extra tokens. There's no ICO, there's no extra, you know, nothing in the middle to actually get in the way of using it. It's just good system and protocol design. However, for merchants, a lot of them, they're not going to hire their own custom team to do all the implementations and actually make sure their server uh, will have uh, all of the uh, ability to run a Cardano node in order to create the invoice to then send to the user. And so while Sire itself is going to have, uh, currently it's just a protocol, has no business model. I have no intention of making billions and you know getting to the moon off this. I'm just curious about this from a practical aspect because I really want to solve this problem for cryptocurrencies, but also from an intellectual aspect because it's an interesting problem that even though we're 10 years into cryptocurrencies, no one's really solved and people have tried, have made in my opinion, overly complex systems that haven't solved the problem because as we can see, currently there is no standard. And so for merchants, maybe for some of the software that automatically generates our invoices uh, for one merchant or another, maybe there could be a, a middleman of sorts that does all of the in-between for the merchants and makes it a really simple process. So it's just a WordPress plugin. It's just a drag and drop JavaScript. You know, it's just very simple for implementations uh, to be just used by a merchant who doesn't really care about any of that. And maybe they'll only charge 0.5%, maybe 1%, or maybe it could be completely free open source. Who knows? That's kind of coming in the future. And that's just dependent on uh, the developer base, the market itself. But at its core, Sire is 0%. And so compared to 3%, that's a really big difference. And there's a good incentive that maybe even uh, you know uh, it could be crowdfunded by several different uh, individuals, the community or different companies to create a standard so that they can all use this at 0%. There's a lot of ways this can move forward, but what is important is that it starts at 0% and then it can go up depending on the implementation a merchant uses. Wow, that's pretty good to have that no uh, fees involved with it. And I mean, crypto is already pretty good at first, not to be confused with exchange fees. Exchange fees can be pretty expensive when you make your trades or bring your money off an exchange. But the crypto fees, they are down in the one penny and less than one penny range uh, currently. And like Nano, um, the, the currency called Nano, they have no fees. Right? So if you were to put it in their wallet, you'd be able to make massive transactions with no fees at all. Um, so that's that's pretty neat stuff. I was wondering... What will the first implementation look like? Is it going to be a Chrome plugin? Right. So Sire is not a separate program in itself. It's essentially an attachment, an addition to wallets. And so that's why I'm implementing first in Tesseract wallet and then later on in the year in Euroi wallet and possibly future wallets, which I'm already discussing with. Oh, I get that. Okay. So right now we're on like, we're on Tesseract 1.1. I've I installed it on my, uh, right tablet here and um so a test rack 1.2 or 1.3 might have that protocol built into it that's how it'll be implemented. exactly and so in the test rack wallet you'll open it up and maybe you'll have a new tab or a new drop down and it'll say invoices and let's say you'll have a list of invoices which arrive to you whether off chain or on chain and maybe you'll have let's say a plus where you just click plus and then a invoice creation screen comes out 
And then you just have, who are you sending the invoice to? How much are you requesting? A secret message of like, do you want uh, to make it identifiable to the person receiving the invoice? And then you just press send invoice. And then it's, you know, it's just a few more inputs than a average uh, transaction you send, but it makes the whole process much more secure. And it'll be a really nice UI that's easy for even your grandma to use. Cause it's a very simple concept. Everyone understands invoices, right? It's not this brand new, it's not a DAO, it's not smart contracts, it's an invoice, just in a different ecosystem, essentially. Yeah, that does make more sense because the invoice is like a receipt. Oh, here's what you're gonna pay for. Here you go, buddy. Cool. That's fascinating, fascinating. And do you think when, let's say two, three years out, and cryptocurrencies are more interoperable and uh, you request, I request 10 ADA from Robert and he doesn't have ADA, he has Ethereum. Do you think that your processing platform will be able to delineate, you'll be able to send, will you be able to work with the interoperability of certain blockchains in order to accept multiple different cryptocurrencies for your invoices? Right. So. This is something I actually um, already talked uh, a bit with um, Tesseract about uh, for implementations. Since if you have a multi-currency wallet, it'd be really nice to you know uh, send an invoice and specify, hey, I can send, uh, uh, sorry, I want to request 30 ADA or 0.001 ETH or whatever. And so uh, this is slightly different to what you're saying, but I'll get to that in a moment. So essentially uh, within the release of the Tesseract implementation of Sire, you will very likely be able to specify uh, an invoice for off-chain at least, because on-chain this gets pretty lengthy and you'll pay a pretty high transaction fee. Uh, but off-chain, you'll be able to say, hey, I want to request uh, one invoice with five different transactions, or sorry, five different cryptocurrencies. And so you'll specify each cryptocurrency and how much you want. And so in that case, you can kind of do what you're saying. However, to actually have this purely interoperable where say you request just ADA from me, but then I uh, have ETH. And so then I send ETH, which gets automatically exchanged for Cardano and then sent uh, to the person. That's, you know, might require side chains, complicated smart contracts. And do I see it being possible? Yes, I think, I think we have the technology already but it's very hard to make everything work together. That's a really big endeavor. And so that might take two or three years, like you're saying. And so on the less practical end where you specify every single cryptocurrency you may want and a different address for each one and have this like a multi-currency Sire invoice, that's going to be by the end of the year for sure be implemented. But this truly cross blockchain dynamic uh, auto exchanging version, that's going to take two or three years. But I do think it is possible. Interesting. So I wanted to, this may be a little bit off topic, but I think that it may be within your realm. So I don't know how closely you've been following the IOHK, the Cardano Atala project. And uh, the, the premise of that project is they're going to be offering a blockchain solution to the government within uh, Ethiopia to basically charge um, certain fees for whatever they're charging for. I, I'm not 100% sure. Utilities, what, I think. Was one utilities, yes, yes. So in essence, and I've heard Charles say on an AMA before that um, basically IOHK will be making money off the back end. So implementing this system for free, but doing these microtransactions or percentage transactions based on number of transactions or however their business model is. So it seems like these solutions are are going to be monetized in the future, these invoice-based solutions. I'm not 100% sure that it's 100% invoice-based, but it seems like it's going forward in that way. So do you feel any pressure to monetize your model in any way? Um, I know you mentioned that you're not in that space right now, but uh, is, there, is there a possibility of doing something like that in the future? So this is something I have spoken with d about because, I mean, they're primarily a startup accelerator, right? So um, while they're doing these fellowships, which have the option to do to create protocols or different kinds of open source software that might not be monetizable, 
you know, by far, they are still focused on making profit. So this is uh, something, this has been something we've talked about. And I'm adamantly opposed to putting a monetization scheme directly into the protocol because you're making the user experience considerably worse and you're providing no extra value for the end user. All you're doing is requiring that they buy an extra token, use or have wallet developers track another blockchain. It just makes the whole system harder to use. And so if you're putting in a monetization model and all it does is add negative effects to the whole model, well, you know, that's bad system design and it's not good because one day someone will come around, you know, maybe fork your code, take that monetization model out and then, well, there goes your whole money making scheme and you're not providing actual value to people, right? So instead, in the case of like uh, what I was speaking about before, more on the merchant side of things where they just want to get something working, have it, you know, just that easy to implement. Being essentially a middleman that provides the software for generating the our invoices for sending it to people without having them required to run their own full node. Having that uh, be a service essentially, which maybe a merchant can pay a monthly fee or maybe a per invoice fee. This is, I mean, you know, you just have to think about it and see what makes the most sense. Uh, but having that essentially become a service-based uh, company that makes integration simple, that's something that is definitely a potential. And so uh, before that actually becomes realistic, we first need wallets that support Sire, right? You can create a company that does the most amazing thing ever, but if no one's using wallets that implement Sire, well, you're not going to have any customers. No one's going to want it. And so right now it's about implementing Sire in as many wallets as possible, getting people to see how much better this whole invoice-based system is compared to the traditional push-based system and have people actually excited about using Sire. Then once there's a user base, more wallets will be interested in implementing it because you people don't want to lose money, right? And once people see they won't lose money when using this, and it might only cost them half a cent more uh, on chain or zero cents off chain, you know, it's, uh, you could say that there's no reason not to use it. And so once there's a solid user base, once there's enough wallets that actually support it, then it makes sense to start looking at making an integration solution so that everyone, whether they're on Ethereum, Bitcoin, Cardano, brand new blockchain in 2022, they can just implement this one simple, you know, JavaScript byte or WordPress plugin, and then they have access to Sire invoices in the entire blockchain ecosystem. And so that's more the long-term uh, focus and aim. Okay. So, so what you need to do is you need to make payments as simple and easy as using eBay and Amazon and we're not there yet, but it sounds yep. like this is one of the cogs in the, in the wheel that will help get us to that point where making payments with crypto is as easy as making payments on, on eBay and Amazon. Exactly. Good. That stuff. sounds good. Sounds good. So one final question, and then we're going to move over to the Reddit questions. If that's okay with you, um, you've mentioned D lab several times. Can you explain to our new viewers or people that are not familiar with Emergo? What is D lab and how did you get involved? Right. So D lab is a startup accelerator that was created by Emergo and SOSV. SOSV is a venture capital fund and Emergo is, as everyone knows, the, uh, marketing and business side of Cardano. And so essentially, DLab came about due to the fact that we're in very early days of blockchain, and especially for Cardano. And so to really get uh, new businesses going that support Cardano and really enrich the ecosystem, it makes sense to have a startup accelerator so that startups can get funded uh, for $200,000 and then have a four month incubation period where they get really drilled. They have a full network of uh, entrepreneurs and residents as they're called. So essentially previous entrepreneurs who have been very successful and give them tips, advice, and essentially incubate them to be a successful business. And that's what D-Lab was created to do is to create a brand new cohort 
and a generation of blockchain companies specifically targeting Cardano who can change the ecosystem and the landscape as a whole. And on top of that, uh, D-Lab is not just a startup accelerator because that's primarily what SOSV has focused on since I think the late nineties. So they're really good at being at creating new startup accelerators. And that's why D-Lab is as good as it is because they have, you know, over 20 years of experience with the help of SOSV and all the Cardano and technical experience, thanks to Emergo. And so they have this good balance between uh, people who know how to invest in companies and people who understand Cardano. But as I was saying, they're not only a startup accelerator, they're also doing fellowships, which is what I am, a D-Lab Emergo fellow. And fellowships uh, specifically are essentially projects which may either eventually become a startup, but they're not really developed yet. The idea is at a very early stage. And so it needs an even longer incubation period. And so they can provide a stipend to have you do research and development work to get that to a point where you might start up a company. Or if you're doing open source work and you're creating a protocol, say like me with Sire or a library or something of that sort, which can make a really big difference, whether in blockchain as a whole or specifically for Cardano, then they're really willing and interested in investing in these individuals who put in lots of time and effort into these things which may not be immediately profitable or maybe profitable at all, but can have a really big impact for the ecosystem as a whole. And I mean, if people are interested, the very first cohort uh, finished a couple weeks ago for DLab. And there is a brand new startup cohort starting within probably August, September range. And so if you're interested, you have a great idea about building on blockchain, building on Cardano, and you want to make a startup, I recommend going to, I believe it's dlab.vc. Otherwise, just search dlab Emergo on Google and you'll easily find the website. And you can uh, go through an interview process and maybe you'll be part of the next cohort and maybe I'll be seeing you in September, the, this, uh, this upcoming September. Otherwise, you can also uh, try to become a fellow if you have this genius idea and you want to really develop and invest every day of your life into, then you also go to dlab.vc, go through the questionnaire, and you can get uh, on the path to be enrolled as a fellow. You know, Robert, you are the the best articulated guy I've seen explain anything like that yet, except for Philippe. Philippe is the other best articulator in the Cardano <laughs> system. Emergo should hire you as a pimp. <laughs> they really should, man. <laughs> that was great, man. I Rick. love that. I love that. Put that on air. That's going on air. <laughs> Emergo, hire this guy as a pimp. <laughs> Philippe's going to kill me. After Thank you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll talk to them about it. We'll see. I'll get back to you. Yeah. No, I just did. I just talked to them about it. You're good. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Philippe's going to oh, kill me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's about that time for the Reddit questions now. <laughs> Let's move forward. Um, Rick, I don't know if you wanted to start. Um, we have a few Reddit questions. Maybe we can do it. Um, Rapid fire. I see a lot of Reddit questions from each individual. So, yes, we have a million Reddit questions from a few okay. people. Yes, let's, <laughs> let's see if we can do ten questions in ten minutes. Okay, let's do it. Okay, and it's ten ten questions per person who asks. Okay, so our first, I'll start with the rapid fire. Okay, Philippe, and our yes. first, uh, our first round of rapid fire questions comes from. Wolf and Apples, Reddit user Wolf and Apples. Thank you very much, Wolf and Apples, for submitting your Reddit questions. We very much appreciate your participation in this podcast. And so the first question here is, can you tell us about some of your hobbies? Uh, sure. Uh, the two biggest hobbies in my life currently are rock climbing and swing dancing. And so I really enjoy being, uh, I guess, movement that is not the norm, not just you know lifting weights, kind of doing the same repetitive thing over and over again but things that more challenge you mentally while you're doing something very physical. And I think rock climbing and swing dancing both really fit that. Yeah, that's good. I hope you're paying attention to rock climbing because if you fall, that kind of sucks. Speaking of I've rocks, already been injured before, so <laughs> <laughs> learned my lesson already. <laughs> All right. Hey, 
that's that's life, man. Good. Oh, so the, speaking of rocks, the next question is: You've worked on the rock pie nodes. <laughs> now, that, was a, that was a great fun. <laughs> that was a great transition. Great transition. <laughs> that was a double entendre. I yeah. watched Deadpool. I know double entendre. <laughs> yeah. So you worked on rock pie nodes. Now, Siri, what's next, and why Cardano? What's next? I mean. I'm constantly talking with people with brand new ideas. Uh, and also, I have a great appreciation for a functional smart con contract language like Plutus. And that's why you know I made the very first uh, Plutus tutorial on Clio 1. And so for me personally, a big focus is looking at, with Cardano, we have this UTXO-based system and this functional programming language and seeing how those two come together, what kind of different design patterns are going to come out of all this. I mean, this is very nerdy talk, but essentially I'm excited to see what is possible because we have never dipped our toes into a fully Turing complete functional smart contract language on a UTXO based system before. And Cardano is the very first to test that out. And so it's very interesting to see what's going to come of that. And that's something which I am excited for and also doing some small side projects and also doing some contracting out uh, into that direction. I think we lost Rick. Si, senor. Yes, he is frozen. He is frozen. Let's wait. <laughs> he was too excited okay. about calling me a pimp and then- yeah. <laughs> We lost you, Rick. Yeah, I lost me too. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, next no question. Action. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's a technical difficulty. Just leave that in there. <laughs> <laughs> We're on to the next question. Uh, blockchain projects interest. Okay, cool. All right. So the blockchain interest. Uh, so let's segue that into. So Robert, what other blockchain projects, if any, interest you? So, I mean, there's a lot of blockchain projects out there. As I'm sure people know, there's like 35 new projects uh, every single week. And one thing that I have come to find as a standard is that I don't really need to bother paying attention to most of them because I've read through so many white papers and I know pretty much every single one, they talk a big talk, but they can't actually do anything themselves. But saying that, um, IOHK, and I think uh, Charles recently talked about this in an AMA uh, and maybe tweeted out about it. There's a project uh, called Ergo, E-R-G-O, which uh, Alex Chapornovi, I don't recall how to say his last name. It's Russian. My apologies. Uh, but he was uh, previously an IOHK-sponsored uh, researcher, and he did some research for IOHK in relation to smart contracts in a uh, in a UTXO based system. And they have a new blockchain coming out in June called Ergo, E-R-G-O. You can Google, I think, Ergo platform. And they have, they are a proof of work blockchain. So for many people here who prefer proof of stake, this won't be your cup of tea, but they're doing a lot of uh, new steps and they actually have a slightly different smart contract model in a UTO, a UTXO based blockchain called self replicating coins, uh, which is different to the extended UTXO based model that Cardano is going to be using. And so for the very nerdy people out there, uh, this is a really interesting blockchain because they're doing really new things. But for a lot of people, maybe they won't be the most interested because essentially it's another proof of work coin that has strong fundamentals about uh, you know an immutable blockchain, and having the whole, you know, the original uh, crypto dream of having a cryptocurrency that is immutable with some privacy features and actually just works. And everyone who uses it can mine it with their own GPU. And one of the benefits of Ergo is that uh, you can't create pools. And so everyone has to be their own miner themselves. And so there's some interesting facets there. And to, honestly, they're one of the only blockchains in the past year that I've seen that's anything near interesting that's actually, you know, going to be put the market. And so if people are interested, check that out. 
No, that's great to hear that you are interested in other blockchains and we like talking about them here on the Cardano Effect. So thanks for that information. Uh, and, you know, for example, EOS has a really big announcement coming out tomorrow. Today's May 31st, June 1st. They got something big coming out. And also they're good. They have a developer who's going to try to create a Twitter like uh, application to compete with Twitter, which I think is a great idea. Oh. I wish Cardano would have gotten in on that earlier, but I guess we'll see what EOS comes up with and maybe Cardano right. can do better than that. Cool. Uh, so the next question here in our rapid fire sequence is, can you share some big issues Emergo wanted to tackle in the blockchain space? Now I understand if you have like an NDA or something like that, you can't talk about it, but uh, are there any other big issues Emergo wanted to tackle? Or that you, Robert, wanted to tackle? <laughs> of course. Uh, I mean, another big issue they want to tackle is to have what my, uh, what the other D-Lab fellow, Qua, is doing, which you can go check out at Soshen.io, S-O-S-H-E-N.io. And it's the fact that setting up a full node, especially if you're using the Haskell code base or the Rust code base, you know, you have to make decisions which code base you want to use. Once Shelly comes out, you know, that's a lot of um, time and effort. And so having a really easy full node service, which is what Qua created with Socian.io, is uh, one of the really big issues that Emergo wanted to tackle. Because people constantly, uh, I mean, if people have used Daedalus, they know they've had some issues with running a full node just for a simple wallet. But then if you're actually creating dApps or implementing a, an exchange or other things like that, which requires a full node to work, well, then having something like Socian, which is a full node as a service. So then all you have is a simple uh, API, and that's really easy to use. That was something that Emergo really wanted to tackle. And it's great that my fellow fellow, <laughs> uh, Qua, has uh, recently released, I believe, three weeks ago. So if people are interested, go check that out. Awesome. Thank you for that. Socian. I love these Japanese names that they're using. Yes. And the uh, the ancient names, the ancient Greek names. Uh, the naming conventions in Cardano is incredible. I just love it. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, so someone had – there, there's a few other things. What's a rough estimate when we can see Sire on Euroi or Daedalus? Uh, you gave us a brief on that earlier. Give us a quick summary. When will we see it on Euroi and Daedalus? When will we see it on Tesseract? So for Tesseract's wallet, it is slated for likely midsummer, give or take maybe half a month to a month. For Euroi, that is completely dependent upon Shelly. So, and same thing for Daedalus. Uh, I still need to uh, speak more with IHK. I'm, you know, uh, very much embedded within Emergo, so I can give you a guarantee it will definitely be implemented in Euroi by the end of the year. Daedalus, we shall see. Awesome. All right, and the last point on here is not a question, but it's uh, from Wolf and Apples. Not a question, but your hair looks awesome. I agree, Wolf and Apples. <laughs> I think if Robert ever has any issues with uh, software engineering, he could definitely do shampoo commercials. Um, <laughs> What's saying yeah. that I haven't already? Yeah. And yeah, oh, wow. I didn't know. <laughs> there was actually another really good question there. It said, will it be possible to send an invoice for X amount of group addresses where any of those addresses can pay the full amount X? And once the transaction is complete, the invoice can be sent to the other... Uh, to the other addresses expires. Um, do you want to see that one visually or do you kind of get what they're asking there? I think you touched on this earlier. Right, so a complex model like that requires smart contracts. And so one thing I would have wanted to do with Sire is have it be blockchain agnostic, as I mentioned earlier. And to keep a blockchain agnostic, you can't use smart contracts because Bitcoin doesn't have smart contracts and every single smart contract platform works differently, supports different things. And so this is something actually I have thought about before. And I am I know it is possible with Plutus smart contracts, as I know how to code in Plutus. Though, is it in the scope of my project? No, because I have a different specific goal. Will it be implemented in Cardano? And maybe will I be one of the people doing it in the near future? Very possibly so. The next question comes from user Lion Likes Cookies, and um, it was a response to a following quote. A quote from an Emergo article said, as I was looking through the Haskell code, I realized you can append data to transactions in Cardano. And 
the user Lion Likes Cookies asked, how does this work and how might other dApps benefit from this you from using this and from using this feature? And I think you 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 slightly went into that, but I don't know if you wanted to give a quick summary of how that how this is going to work again. Right. So how this is specifically going to be implemented in Shelly is still unknown to us. And so it's uh I mean you can read the formal specifications, which I've read a few, but none of those are necessarily public. So I probably won't go too much into detail, but to suffice to say, the vast majority of blockchains enable that. And even with Plutus, you can embed arbitrary data. And so essentially you can have whatever kind of data used within transactions and sent to a user. And I personally think this is a very unexploited uh, feature used by most people in all different blockchains. And so with Sire, I hope this is the you know initial kickoff where people realize, hey, this is possible. And maybe they can think of even crazier things down the line. Perfect, perfect. Awesome. Rick, last question, last Reddit question. Oh, it's a big one. You want me to get yes. that? Okay. Uh, yes. So it's one question with multiple parts. Actually, it's one user. Okay, so we got Reddit user University. And Reddit user University asks, hi, Robert, the need for transaction reversal comes with many facets. So we're talking about reversing a transaction. Can you explain how do you approach the following? And number one is money sent to a non-existent address, which I think is handled by the blockchain, and money sent to the address of a wallet that I deleted. Say I deleted a wallet, saved somewhere, deleted it, and money sent to the wrong person where you have a valid address and all, but not the intended recipient. So in the first case, it's money sent to a non-existent address. In the second one, money sent to a wallet that you deleted or you did not intend to. And third is money sent to the wrong person. What do you think of that? What are your thoughts? So two points. Number one, the point of Sire is not to have transaction reversal, but it's to guarantee that when you send the transaction, you won't need a transaction reversal. And so, you know, it, like in most of life, uh, in health, it's better to have prevention than to have a remedy. And so same thing in blockchain. With Sire, you have the prevention where you will not mess up sending your coins to the correct, uh, to the incorrect place. And so you will have the surety. With that said, I think that's a much better approach to take rather than focusing on the reversals because with reversals, you have much more complexity. How does it work? Uh, is there loopholes which someone can abuse? These are all questions and usually you require smart contracts. And so that's not in the scope of Sire and I don't think it's the best uh, first uh, approach to take. But nonetheless, I do think, uh, well, number one, I know it is possible. Uh, and number two, I do think it is also useful to look into, especially in circumstances like withdrawing from exchanges, for example. And for exchanges, that can make a lot of sense to have a reversal period. And for such things, uh, that is actually very much possible to encode within Plutus so that when you send a transaction, you could say, uh, for maybe the next two days, I can still take that transaction back. But then after those two days, only the recipient is allowed to spend that uh, UTXO. And so in essence, you have like a two day interim period where technically it's not owned by the receiving party, but then afterwards it is completely owned by them. And so you have a reversal period. And so that is completely possible and actually will be a use case for Plutus. Yes, and I like the last one you described the most of the options because my personal belief is you should never reverse a transaction. It should simply be the first transaction was complete. The giving back of the money is a second transaction done willingly by both parties, yes. which is what happens in the real world. You know, you, yes, there's, there's no such thing as clicking a button and magically the money that's in that cash register reappears in my pocket. No. If don't do it on blockchain, it's a really bad idea. Yeah. What do you yeah. think of that, Philippe? I agree. I agree. It's there's a difference between transactional uh, tr reversals, transaction reversals, and refunds. And refunds need to be implemented. I mean, if you're having a party, you you buy something on crypto eBay or whatever decentralized application, Open Bazaar. Let's say Open Bazaar. And if there's a dispute, 
that needs to be settled in a separate transaction, not necessarily taking things back. That's a very bad precedence to to start considering because then you start centralizing certain powers and certain powers are going to have a little bit more power to reverse those transactions than the other party. And it's going to be skewed and some people, it's not going to work out. And usually the people yeah. with the bigger wallets are going to be able to control that transaction. Um, and so that leads us to our last question. There are other questions from Reddit user University, but this will be the last one we touch on. It is directly related to the current subject. And University asks, is there any plan to handle stolen cash? Now, I know this doesn't have anything to do with Sire, but these are great questions to be discussed on the podcast. And uh, this Reddit user goes on to explain in a very brilliant way. Uh, we had a hack on Binance a few weeks ago. It seems we can trace the flow of the cash from wallet to wallet. Would it be possible or desirable to mark those funds as tainted and unusable? I imagine the process to support something like this would be very tricky. And the question is, is there a plan to handle stolen cash? As you said, with Insire, that is not the case. But this is, I know, IOHK, is some, it, this is something they have looked into and are looking into. And I think as a general uh, basis, for is that possible? Very much so. Um, in a UTXO-based blockchain, you can just follow the transactions and see where all the tainted cash uh, goes through and where it ends up. Is this desirable? This starts to get more complicated because what if someone purchases something and didn't know that it was tainted and now they have tainted cash? Are they just now out of money and you know they, they get screwed over? There's a lot of implications for what this kind of system uh, it'll have on the average user who very likely will, unbeknownst to them, somehow get into uh, ownership of such funds. It's very possible, especially once uh, cryptocurrencies become a very core part of an economy. Um, maybe if there's really strong barriers in place so that once something is marked as you know, uh, stolen funds, then uh, you know the whole network acknowledges it, but then that's also a centralizing factor, right? Because then who decides if it's you know faulty funds? That starts to get tricky. And so, like I said, prevention is always better than a remedy. And so, like in the previous question, possibly what exchanges could do is simply have these smart contract-based uh, withdrawals where they can. I take back the withdraw after a two day period or before a two day period. And after that, it's actually owned by the receiving party. And so that way, in that case, it's not really a transaction reversal. There's no marking of uh, funds. There's just a two day waiting period essentially where the funds are held in limbo, but in a completely decentralized limbo where there's no centralized actor that can do the reversal. It's just the two parties interacting with each other. And so after the two days, where the exchange sees that, hey, this payment went through, there's no issues, no problems, the user receives the funds and everything's good. But then if a hacker withdraws and is in that two day period, well, then they can withdraw that back and there is no centralizing factor. And a system like this, I think will probably be implemented in the coming future, but it just depends on blockchains being able to support this. Yeah, and I would love to see IOHK Research find a solution to that stolen funds problem because uh, in an example, you know, history repeats itself. And a perfect example is the EOS, um, sorry, not EOS, but Ethereum and Ethereum Classic fracture. That's why they fractured because of the DAO, the DAO hack, their stolen funds. Ethereum decided to reverse the blockchain and it fractured uh, the community. And Ethereum Classic went off and said, no, we will never reverse a blockchain. And Ethereum did do it. So, could it happen again in the future? Sure, history repeats itself. I want to thank uh, everyone, all the Redditors, for asking questions. We really appreciate it. Once again, we're if you want to log off now, we're going to cover a couple subjects that are a little bit different right now. But I wanted to thank Robert Kornacki for joining us today on the podcast. And it, we're all we're constantly talking about developers within the community and advancing the blockchain. 
this is the guy right here. I mean, he's done so many different projects. We have Sire, we have Cleo Da One, we have the Rock Pie. He's doing a lot for Cardano. He's been doing a lot. He's very active in the community and he is working. He's working. So if if Cardano is really going to advance and dApps are going to be built, it's going to be people like Robert that are going to advance our ecosystem. So that being said, I'm going to pass the mic over to Rick. Rick, we had a couple of housekeeping to talk about, housekeeping things to talk about that we spoke about before. And uh, once again, if you're not interested in this, you can log off now. But um, Rick, take it away. OK, there were two subjects I need to touch on uh, for the sake of the community, for good communications. And that is the ambassador program and uh, trolls, okay? And so for as far as the Cardano ambassador program, all three of us here are ambassadors. I'm an ambassador, Philippe, and Robert is also. And uh, the reason I wanna to touch on it is because our community lacks guidance. There's a lack of clarity about what the, the ambassador program is, although it's very clearly laid out on the websites. It's been laid out in text. Where people are getting confused is, are Cardano ambassadors paid? The answer is no. Cardano ambassadors are not paid. Okay. Uh, Philippe, any comments on that? That's 100% accurate. Uh, Robert, do you want to add anything on that? Cardano ambassadors are not paid. No, not at all. But the thing is, they're not paid because we want to incentivize people to have this as a passion, right? So I think it makes sense not to just try to pay people to be able to do all these core community things and then draw in the wrong crowd. But the whole point of the ambassador program is to bring people into the ecosystem who really care about it and then bring them up and have them as ambassadors for Cardano. Yes. All, all three of us have been involved with the Cardano community prior to the ambassador program even existing or us having any prior knowledge of the ambassador program. I know you may not know us outside of the Cardano effect, but we've been very passionate about this project and we've been doing our own separate projects and own separate lanes and right now we're converging to a podcast episode but uh we're we've been trying to get people to speak about the cardano ambassador program hopefully we can get some representatives on soon so we can figure out exactly the direction of where this is going but we're not we're not paid cardano ambassadors at all so. Yeah, and, and thank you for that, Philippe. And a little bit of history on it. All of the ambassadors, right now there's about 30 of them. All of the ambassadors, are they've been around longer than a year. They were volunteers first. They were passionate first. They were plain old community members, just like every every one of us here on the, viewing the podcast. And, and they just, they're translators. They did some translation work on websites. You have moderators who simply set up a, a, and became a mod. Uh, you got guys like Philippe and I making YouTube videos. We did that first. Then later on, along came this ambassador program. And when it first came online, it became very convoluted and confusing. Um, and it's still not entirely clear. And, and that was to incentivize people. And like Robert said, you want to get the right people in who are passionate about it, not because they're in it for the money. Because if the only people you have to like, yes, I'm in it for the money, well, they're not going to do it because they're passionate or they're not going to do it because they're skilled. And I'll give you a perfectly good example. The number one Cardano YouTube channel right now is Philippe's. He built that before he was an ambassador. He had thousands and thousands of subscribers, and he's still – the number one, his channel is bigger than this podcast. He built that. And him being his ambassador is, you know, irrelevant, really. So thanks, Philippe. You're awesome, bro. <laughs> thanks, Rick. So are you. So are you. Yeah, man. Hey, let's have a little hug, group hug, and, right? Oh. And if, if you don't know, yeah. Rick has been cranking out content on the Digital Fortress channel as well. And it's been a great our, – our, our channels complement each other very well. And we share some of the same audience and I, I think it's perfect. And everyone here, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm invested in Cardano. Like I've been invested for a very long time. This is why I'm very passionate about the project as well. But I do this because I love to do it. Rick and I, we do, we have normal regular jobs that we do, you know, like I, we, this is what we do extra. 
This is what we yeah. do extra. And we spend a lot of time. I spend more time in cryptocurrency and blockchain than I do what I what I traditionally do. So that being said, you know, <laughs> I just think that this is the prime time for cryptocurrency and prime time for blockchain. And this is one of the projects that if they get all their things done, they have a very good chance of succeeding and doing big things in the future. So yeah. And and that's another thing I wanted to clarify as well, Philippe, is the fact that uh, Philippe and I are not paid as ambassadors. This podcast is sponsored by IOHK because IOHK chose to sponsor the podcast. We could get, I, if I could, I would get Monster Energy to sponsor this podcast, right? I would get Nano. We, tr we tried um, <laughs> other, uh, we have written emails to other large names to try to get sponsors and if it's not a bull market, it's hard to get sponsors. So we're very yeah. lucky to have IOHK as a sponsor. And when people start attacking my sponsor or me and saying, hey, you guys are getting paid. What you should be doing, blah, 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 blah. It kind of makes me go, wow, they really don't understand how this works. Not so at all. Not at all. We're, we're not subsidized. Uh, we are not employees. Philippe and I own this podcast. Yes. We yes. call all the shots. Yes. No and one our sponsor supports us. Get Philippe. Exactly. No one influences what we say on this podcast. We're just speaking from the heart. Uh, sponsorship, it, IOHK is helping us in the sense that when we need to reach out to people, we have a communication line to get some of the employees that are behind their desk for 23, 24 hours a day and maybe are not in tuned into crypto Twitter and maybe get them on, on the podcast every now and then. But Rick and I, this is our podcast. This is our we 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 birth this podcast we do a lot to improve the quality of the podcast as as it moves forward and whatever we can do we we look for sponsorships and as rick said we've reached out to ledger we've reached out to trezor and it's a bear market it's a bear market it's hard it's it's difficult so we're going to continue pushing and monster energy i mean I would put the little watermark logo right there if they uh, if they sponsored our podcast today so that's that and yeah, and we're not sponsored for our individual YouTube channels, which came way before it, it's we're, we're spawned. The podcast is sponsored. That's it. That's it. And anyone is free to contact IOHK, do their own thing, put the work in and show the community that you're really pumping, pumping out that content. A lot of people are doing that and it only leads to different opportunities as time progresses. Yes, and thank you for thank you for that, Philippe. And that also helps lead into the next subject that I wanted to touch on, um, and that was trolls and how to deal with trolls. Um, it's a touchy subject. Philippe and I's policy is ignore. If someone trolls, we just ignore it. We have so many good community members out there. We can't waste our time on trolls. Um, not naming names. There's no one in particular, no one specifically that that we need to deal with, but. I'm going to do some basic math. Let's say there are 10,000 active community members in Cardano. And on Reddit, we have 71,000 semi-active, most likely most of them inactive, just rough numbers. Okay. And don't beat me up on my numbers, but let's say we have 10,000 semi-active members. And of those 10,000 semi-active people, um, let's say we have two trolls, for example. Okay. Let's not waste our time on the trolls. Let's waste our time on those 9,998 good people and uh, normal people, or just for lack of a better word, because Cardano is going to get gigantic. And when Tar Cardano grows from 10,000 with two trolls to 100,000, well, that's going to be 20 trolls. And then eventually it will be 10 million people with 2,000 trolls. So what we as a community need to learn to do is there's three ways you can handle a troll. You ignore, you delete, or you ban. If you engage a troll, the matters will get worse. And this is good advice for Cardano leadership everywhere, uh, including Emergo, IOHK, and the Cardano Foundation. I'm not trying to uh, pontificate from the bully pulpit of a podcast, although that's what it sounds like. It's good advice. If you engage the trolls, it gets worse. I don't know, Philippe, what's your take on uh, dealing with trolls and what our policy is on the Cardano effect? 
I agree. I agree. The best is just to move forward. Um, I've been on YouTube for quite some time, so I get quite a fair share of trolling comments on my own personal YouTube com uh, on my own personal YouTube page, and it's difficult sometimes because the most negative comments are the ones that pop out the most, even though. 99% of them are very positive, but sometimes you get destroyed or distracted. But we have to remember that it's not about any individual person up here. It's not about Rick. It's not about me. It's not about Robert. We're all working together to make this bigger. And, you know, I know everyone's concerned about getting rich, but you'll get rich while we're growing this ecosystem. So let's not make it about individual people and their flaws. And let's just if we're pumping out good content and trying to educate in the best way we see fit, then let's move forward. And if you feel like you can do a better job, then get out there and do it. You don't have to clown people or say negative things. Just go and do it. Everyone has a computer that's that's typing these comments. And the webcam, they're really not expensive. Um, Prime Day is right around the corner. You probably can get a great deal. You know, two day shipping, one day shipping, you know, two hour shipping, get it straight to your thing. Just get in front of the camera and make your piece. But no need to bring anyone else down. Everyone is doing their best. If you feel like you're smarter, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, Rob, Robert, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. We've been we've been on our soapbox for a while. Yeah, I mean. Trolls are a part of life. I'm sure everyone who's been on the internet for more than a nanosecond has experienced them. And I think it's just, uh, you know, when especially you have so much time, energy, money invest into a project, uh, when trolls come into the picture, I'm sure a lot of people can take it uh, a bit personally. I, I understand that completely. But uh, just like you guys said, you have to just keep moving forward. Don't worry about it. And it's, you know, people won't remember the trolls. They'll remember what you did in spite of the trolls. So, yeah, good advice, Robert. And there are 7.1 billion people on planet Earth. It's a giant ocean. There's plenty of room for more podcasts. And there's a lot of really good people out there who deserve our time and they deserve our effort. We don't need to spend our time on people who are in, with inside the Cardano system trying to tear it down or trolls from the outside trying to penetrate. And, and you know, crypto has a, a concept behind it where you reward the honest parties and you punish the adversaries. Um, that doesn't just apply to computer code. I mean, that applies to humans. That's where the concept came from. And so, if when the trolls start to pile up, you, you can ignore, delete, or ban. That's their punishment. Um, if you engage a troll, you are, you are rewarding the troll. So just keep that in mind. That's how it works. That's just how people are. I don't make this up. I, I read the internet. We know everything on the internet is true. <laughs> that's all I got, Philippe. Robert, okay. thank you for being on the program. Yes. Do you have any final words for the viewers of the Cardano Effect podcast? We appreciate you having having you on, and you're welcome on any at any time. Do you have any final words? Yes. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on the podcast. It's been a great hour or so. And uh, I guess just in general, um, I would implore people to, if they're interested in Cardano, if they're interested in blockchain, start getting into the community, start developing, start creating things. And especially if you have a great idea, uh, within blockchain and Cardano, then please uh, go to dlab.vc, uh, become a fellow, become a uh, sponsored or a startup which they invest in. And it'd be really great to have not just people who spend their free time, you know, adding to the community, which is really great. And that's what the ambassador program is for. But it's, I think it's most exciting to have more full-fledged companies and people devoted to fellowships, uh, to researching into how to really make this all better. And D-Lab Amerigo is more than willing to put funding behind this. Uh, they still want three more fellows and their next cohort of startups is in most likely around September-ish. And so if you're interested, go to dlab.vc, pitch your amazing brand new idea that's gonna revolutionize blockchain, or even if it's not gonna revolutionize blockchain, but it's just a decent idea that can actually make an impact. 
you know, you, uh, you lose nothing by submitting and going for an interview. And who knows, maybe we'll meet in a few months and your life will never be the same. So. That sounds great. That sounds great. Thanks, everyone. Until the next episode of The Cardano Effect. Bye.